Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, if it's feeling early for you, spare a thought for me because it's even earlier over here. Um, it also seems fitting that for a talk about technology, we should have spent the last 10 minutes pissing around trying to work out how to record, <laughs> how to show videos. Uh, it seems like the perfect preamble to what the whole talk's about, really. Um, I'm guessing, like many of you, this year sort of hit me for six a little bit. Um, at the start of the year, I was mainly a teacher trainer who also wrote course books and ran a summer school face to face in London. Um, at the end of the year, uh, I'm basically someone who sits in my man cave running an online language school. Um, that's not what I've been planning to do, but it's where I've ended up. And I guess as someone interested in kind of, you know, teaching methodology, principles in teaching, etc. I've been thinking quite a lot about this whole pivot that many of us have been forced to make. And, you know, given that coronavirus still seems to be with us, um, you know, in the UK, we have a government that's cunningly avoided a second wave by just prolonging the first wave for as long as it can. But, um, you know, it doesn't show any sign of letting up. I'm guessing many of us are going to be, you know, either embracing or being forced onto technological ways of dealing with teaching in the months and years to come. And this talk really is about some of the things I've been thinking about that I think are issues that emerge from using technology in language teaching. And finally, some sort of principles that I think can guide the way we think about what we're doing as we use technology to interact with our students. And my six main principles that I'm going to kind of go over in detail are these. I'm going to be talking about how I think using technology in and of itself doesn't mean good or bad teaching. It just means using technology in teaching. And that really to think about what value we're adding or what we're doing in the classroom in, in a more practical, principled way, we need to be clear about why we're doing what we're doing. I'm going to be suggesting a few problems, I think, that emerge from the use of technology. One is what I'm going to be calling the cult of the amateur and the damage that it does. I'm going to be looking at the way in which I think technology is kind of ushered in a sort of neo-authenticity to language teaching and why I think that can be problematic sometimes. I'm going to be looking at the kind of content that emerges as we're teaching technologically and what makes good tech content, what makes bad content, but also really just looking at the issue of kind of time and money that these things bring up, I think. Because as was suggested a few minutes ago, you know, many of us have family, a few remaining friends, um, and trying to maintain some semblance of a life whilst adjusting to this new reality. Going to also be maybe, I don't know, critiquing or disagreeing slightly with some of the more evangelical tech heads who seem to believe that technology is inherently motivating in and of itself. Um, I'll be suggesting that maybe that isn't actually the case and that it certainly doesn't provide us with magic bullets or shortcuts in language teaching. And finally, I'll just be suggesting that while interactivity is a good thing, I'm not convinced that interactivity always comes through technology, that actually I think it's the teacher themselves and what the teacher does that facilitates interaction far more than, you know, such semi failed experiments these days as IWBs or all manner of other interactive tech tools. So that's where we're going. Um, these are the kind of issues I'm going to raise before we get on to some principles, okay? So this first idea that using tech is not the same as good teaching. I can remember as far back as the early 2000s where the kind of hardcore tech evangelists at conferences like IATFL and, you know, APAC and TESOL and stuff were basically saying that, you know, in the future, uh, in order to survive, all teachers will be using technology. 
And there was this sort of assumption that by integrating technology into our classroom, we'd become these transformative educationalists. And we obviously had a good eight, nine year period where ed tech people were busy selling us their products predicated on these kinds of promises. Well, for me, the thing I always return to is something the, the great Michael Swan once said, which was language teachers teach language. OK, it's such a sort of blindingly simple statement of the bleeding obvious. Um, but I think it's something we often forget in language teaching. Um, you know, I've always thought it should be kind of stenciled on the wall of every English language classroom. And I think this year, more than any other year, we've been persuaded to kind of feel that it's not our job just to teach language. We have to keep up with the seven alternatives to Zoom. We have to work out how to integrate 54 new tech tools into our non-Zoom platform. And we spend a lot of time stressing and worrying about the tech that we're using. And I think sometimes that gets, uh, sometimes that gets in the way of the fact that what we're really there to do is to primarily teach language. And if tech helps us to teach language, that's great, but it needs to be the thing that's driving our interaction with technology. This idea that there's a clue to what we do in our job titles. If our job title is language teacher, that clue is we're there to teach language. I think part of the problem is and we'll look at some examples of this in a few minutes. There are some strangely old fashioned principles that are still inherent or implicit in many of the sites that are being, I don't know, propagated or spread for us to use as language teachers. And you have this kind of weird tension between cutting edge technology and a lot of, I think, quite outdated material and, you know, stuff that's become available for English language teachers online. And a lot of the time, and I'll just show a couple of examples, um, like a lot of people, I try to keep up with what's out there, what's going on. I subscribe to Nick Peach's emails that go round telling me about the, you know, 37 new tech tools this month that I must try to integrate in order to be a 21st century teacher. Um, I watch Russell Stannard's videos, etc. And where there are sites which focus on language or make lessons or make exercises or material available, both for teachers to use in the classroom and for students to access as self-study material. A lot of the time, just as in the classrooms of old, grammar and vocabulary are treated as separate. Vocabs often just presented as lexical sets. You know, whereas in the old days, students would sit there in classrooms labeling parts of the body in a book. Now they can do a drag and drop self-testing, you know, labeling of things in a kitchen, which gives them free carrots as little badges. A lot of the time, I think usage is seen as relatively unimportant. There's this idea that I think tech really exacerbates that learning must be fun and that technology makes everything fun. There's an idea that creativity and play are really, really important to the learning process that skills and increasingly this is coming to mean digital skills 21st century skills are at least as important as language both for us to be teaching or trying to teach and for students to be learning and there's this idea that just more is good you know more tools more tech more add-ons more more means more and i don't think this is necessarily always true when you start looking at a lot of what's out there, you see really weird stuff, okay? Um, this was something uh, both Nick Peachy and Russ were pushing for quite a long time, which is a site called Lingro. And we were told this is a great self-study tool for students. You can teach your students to use it. Spend 10 minutes of your classroom time, not teaching them some language, but showing them how to 
go out and get language for themselves. What was interesting about Lingro was it exposes very, very quickly the limitations of a lot of open source, free access stuff. So the basic idea was you could drop any article into Lingro, you pick your language, you hover over the articles, and Lingro will give you a pop-up dictionary that will help you with any new words. So rather than having to keep switching back and forth to dictionaries, Lingro does it all for you. Well, it does and it doesn't. Uh, I kept this screenshot from my very first encounter with Lingro, but basically if you go there, it's still the same. They use an open source dictionary, okay? So they're based on Wiktionary rather than a dictionary that's been written and crafted by lexicographers who have some experience of English language students and English language teaching. So if you see something like Obama pledges not to delay Afghan withdrawal, and you think, what does withdrawal mean? Well, Lingro's here to help you. Withdrawal means receiving from someone's care what one has earlier entrusted to them. What? So I read that again, and I still don't have any clue what that means. Uh, that, that explanation is way more difficult than the word withdrawal. And actually, I don't think Afghan withdrawal is usually referring to money. So maybe it's number two a type of metabolic shock the body experience undergoes when a substance, usually a toxin, such as heroin to which a patient is addicted, is withheld. Well, thank you, Lingro, for making your explanation so clear and user-friendly. My intermediate students who crave being able to read authentic texts will just love the simplicity of these definitions. And obviously, here, it's not about withdrawal from heroin addiction. So that leaves us with number three, withdrawal, an act of withdrawing. Well, thank you, clear and simple and user-friendly. You know, straight into the digital dustbin. Another one that I saw recently was a, a thing that was being touted called snappy words, and I've just realized that's a really lousy screenshot. Snappy words it is being touted because it's, a, it's visual. It appeals to visual learners. And it doesn't just help you look up words like a, a boring 20th century old fashioned dictionary. It provides a free visual web of words around the word you're looking at. Uh, you can see at the top, there's a little light bulb. Play, lyrics, ideas, snappy, meaning. It's like a sort of shit word cloud from 15 years ago that used to appear in every conference presentation. And what you do is you look up a word like people, okay? So you put people in and people becomes the center of this swirling psychedelic web of words. And basically all around it, you get these crazy things like nationality, peanut gallery, if any of you know what peanut gallery is, tell me and you win some kind of prize. Pocket, okay? It's just completely demented. And you can click on all of these other things. Business people, um, mutually retarded. Okay, I, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. But basically, you click on any of these things you don't understand, like peanut gallery, and it provides you with another web of words. And we wonder why students find learning English difficult if these are the kind of tech tools that are out there that we're kind of being encouraged to hype and push to them. I think what this also connects to is what one of the early critics of the Web 2.0, Andrew Keane, called the cult of the amateur. And it feels weird to me to be, to be criticising amateur work because, you know, I come from a kind of post-punk DIY background. Uh, I was that kid who was making amateur fanzines and amateur records and stuff when I was like 16. So criticizing the idea of the amateur is, is sort of a strange thing for me to find myself doing. But I think part of the problem with the web is because so much stuff is available, quality control often goes out of the window. And I first started thinking about this years ago when I was doing observation at work, when I used to work at University of Westminster. And one of the young teachers on a summer school 
uh, had downloaded a lesson from the web. It was from One Stop English, the Macmillan site. And this lesson began like this. It was a, a headline, Royal Wedding Passes Without a Hitch, as Kate and William seal it with a kiss, okay? So quite a while ago, but this was the, he the headline. And the students had to guess what they thought the article was going to be about. So of course they say, Kate and William wedding. Good, well done. You're developing your predicting skills. They then read through this text that was full of this kind of, you know, quite high level language. It was a pre-intermediate class, okay? So I'm watching this as a kind of supervisor, just thinking, this text is way off level. This is insane. Well, what's the purpose of this language? How does this language get revised and recycled? How does this language connect to what happened in class yesterday? Does any of this language appear in the next text they're going to do? While I was talking this through with the teacher after class, I sort of asked, what, what, what level did you think that text was? And the teacher said to me, well, look, Online, on One Stop English, it says suitable for all levels and it gives three different graded approaches. So I was grading the task, not the text. The task was, what do you think it's going to be about? Read it, see if you were right. I think it's going to be about Kate and William's royal wedding. Yes, you were right. That was it. Um, with a whole load of random, complicated vocabulary. So again, this stuff's online, published by reputable publishers, obviously bashed out on the day in order for teachers to bring in something topical that they've downloaded off the internet and do something connected to what's in the news. But in terms of the grading, in terms of the tasks, in terms of the purpose, the goal, the language aims, in terms of threading language across classes, nada, just completely nothing that that whole kind of idea went out of the window. And I think part of the problem is where you have so much material that's self-published, self-hyped, self-promoted, uh, and often done on the fly very, very quickly in order to be contemporary, well, that undermines the expertise that was out there before. And you know, whatever you think of published course books, They've been through a process. Um, they've been read, reread, reread, piloted, commented on, edited, copy proofed, um, rewritten, checked by different people in different countries. And there's a whole expertise behind the creation, not only of things like course books, but the creation of dictionaries for students, you know. Um, there's a whole kind of course coherence that's often built into published materials. And course materials generally, whether or not you agree with the language principles or the learning principles that underpin them, are based on coherent language and learning principles. And I think unless we're careful, we kind of just throw all of that out of the window and we end up with this sort of random hodgepodge of downloaded bits and pieces which may form interesting one-off lessons but which don't cohere to form a course which makes sense over a long period of time. We end up with entertaining one-offs rather than a sort of overarching umbrella that's based on theories of language and theories of learning. There's also what I think you could call the authenticity fallacy. OK, which is this idea that what the Internet allows us to do is to bring authentic material into the classroom. We can all just zap in YouTube videos or articles that we found online. We can beam them to our students. We can share those in class. Well, as far back as 1980, Henry Widowson was complicating this idea of the authentic inauthentic dichotomy and he was basically saying well a text that's written for language learners in a language classroom by a language teaching professional is authentic for language learners in a language classroom okay a text that's written for economist readers last year 
um, ungraded on the assumption of a whole load of cultural background knowledge and linguistic knowledge is not authentic for a language classroom. And he also had this lovely idea that any text, whether it's authentic or inauthentic, doesn't really become authentic in a classroom, a digital classroom or a face-to-face -face classroom, until the teacher and the students authenticate that text. And really, a text in a language classroom, in order to be authentic, has to be designed and provided in order to teach language that's useful for the students, okay? Um, there needs to be an attempt to make sure the language focus is relevant, that the language focus helps to develop students' communicative outcomes. This means thinking about the frequency of the language we're teaching. So, you know, passes without a hitch sealed with a kiss, not particularly frequent or not particularly relevant to the kind of communicative outcomes you would really want a pre-intermediate class to be aiming towards. Um, there needs to be some space where students exchange their ideas, their feelings around the text, maybe related to culture, maybe related to diversity, and there needs to be some attempt to authenticate the text by human responses to what students have read and by attempts to personalise some of the language that the text has been a vehicle for providing. That doesn't mean we can never use so-called authentic text that we're beaming into our digital classrooms. It just means asking questions about the texts we're bringing in and being clear that the texts we're bringing in do meet these kinds of criteria that are relevant in order for our texts to become authenticated in the classroom. Ah, time and money. <laughs> You know, I'm guessing it's been on everyone's mind this year. Years ago, I was at Spain TESOL and I saw the first teacher I'd ever seen do a talk about class blogs. And it was super impressive that this teacher had been making all these incredible class blogs with her students and was showing all this work she'd been doing and they've all got their own online spaces and platforms and they're all interacting with each other. And I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, I am a complete failure. You know, I've failed to do all this kind of stuff with any of my classes. I'm basically just saying, go home, try to learn the language we've looked at in class and maybe do a page from the workbook. Shit, look at what she's doing. It's, it's, it's next level. Right at the end, someone asked, can I just say this is incredibly impressive and it's really great you've done this. How long does it take you? And she sort of looked guilty and went, ah, well, to be honest, I, I have been spending most of my weekends doing this over the last few months, at which point I suddenly stopped feeling guilty and felt slightly superior because I still like to have a weekend every now and then when I'm not doing eight o'clock in the morning talks for APAC. But I think we need to really be asking ourselves if we're going to use tech and we're going to start creating material, building courses, etc., that's great. Uh, who's paying for it, okay? If you're self-employed, maybe you regard that as investment in your brand. If you're working for a school, are you getting paid for this? Or is this just more stuff that you're being expected to do for free? And also, is it actually worth doing? I think a lot of the time what you learn when you start using technology is teaching with technology does not mean quicker. Years ago, when I used to work at Westminster, I had to mark a lot of essays. I was working on MA courses. I was doing exam courses like IELTS and CPE. And I went through this phase of experimenting with different ways of giving feedback. So I started using this thing called Jing, which was free. Uh, it allowed me to make a five minute video in which I could drop the student's essay, I could circle things and comment on it as I was reading through. And I thought, hey, I usually take 20 minutes to, to correct each essay. Maybe if I can just do a quick five minute video, I can talk through the main points, okay? Uh, and this will, this will make life much easier for me and for my students. <laughs> How innocent and naive I once was. 
well, what happened was I'd sit at home and I'd start doing my five minute video. I'd get three minutes in and my son would barge into the room and interrupt me. So I'd kind of shut the thing off. I'd start again. I'd make the next five minute video. The doorbell would ring and it would be the postman. So I'd stop the video. I'd go off and answer the door. I'd come back. I'd make another five minute video. Three minutes in, I'd completely lose my train of thought and I'd be going, um, oh, fuck, um, oh, bugger, start again. And sometimes I'd take like an hour to make a five minute video. So, you know, is it better? Well, it's better if you can do it once and it only takes you five minutes. Um, if you're really good at that kind of thing, congratulations, fill your boots, maybe it's better. Maybe not, maybe it's better just to limit yourself to five minutes giving written feedback and emailing that. So, you know, it's not that it's not better, but it's just saying it's not automatically quicker, it's not automatically a time saver, and there may be other ways of approaching things that are non-tech, which still do things easier. Even when you do start thinking about ways of integrating, you know, more solid feedback into self-study material, it can be great, okay? It can be really, really useful. Um, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it and the text developing all the time. When I was at Westminster, we used to run these EAP courses. We had thousands and thousands of Chinese kids arriving with IELTS 4.5 needing to be filtered onto their master's courses, which they'd already paid for. And so one of the things we used to do was to design this material that looked at the academic word list and tested it. So we'd have things like, in order to mm, the relative efficacy of tree treatments, we undertook a double blind trial, all that kind of sexy, exciting language you get to look at if you teach loads of IELTS. And they'd be given a choice. So they, they could either just try and do it themselves or they could press a button that would say assessment or assess. And if they got the answer right or wrong, there'd be a feedback response, which we had to write and enter. So we'd say things like, well, assessment's the wrong answer. It's a noun. You can make an assessment. You complete a full assessment. And we'd give them extra feedback like you would as a teacher if you were going through all this stuff. Well, this takes time, okay? And this takes extra work. We were basically expected to do this for free as part of our university hours because we were helping the university prepare for its digital 2015 futures project. And in the end, we all just decided we're not gonna do this anymore because this is eating up our entire lives trying to write this. I know as a course book writer, to write a course book, one level of a course book from start to finish, that's six months of my life out the window, you know, completely just every day, 24 seven, the book sitting in my head while I'm writing it. And I get paid to do that. I mean, I wasn't getting paid to do this. This was kind of extra work I was expected to do. So yes, tech can be great. It can help you write great materials that provide great feedback. It can help you focus on desired student outcomes. It can help you look at usage. It can encourage noticing on the part of students. But let's not delude ourselves and pretend this is possible to do overnight. This is time consuming. The next question is, is technology inherently motivating? Last week, I, I kind of, um probably did a stupid thing and um, ran the risk of becoming Hudella ELT super spreader because I went to Russia and ran three face-to-face -face workshops. Um, <laughs> I'd been paid to do them much earlier in the year and the guy who'd organized them basically said either we repaid the money or we ran them. So we went and ran them. And what was amazing was just how, how desperately keen people were to be in a room with other people who did the same job as them and talk to them and have coffee and catch up with the news and, you know, whilst trying to be relatively safe and be masked up and hand sanitized. These are people who've spent the entire year online, okay, where they're supposed to be motivated because technology is motivating. Well, our students aren't screen agers 24 seven. 
Um, often where students are using technology a lot in their lives, it's not for academic uses, okay? I don't know if you spent any time watching what your average teenager does on technology. Um, it's not using Google Scholar for fun. It's TikTok. You know, it's basically they're sitting there sharing shit videos with their friends. And I think a lot of the time, just because students are technically au fait in certain areas, technologically au fait with certain areas, it doesn't mean they know or even want to necessarily integrate tech into their academic study. I found when I was running MAs or even when I'm running online teacher training courses, students will really only use the tech if they think they're assessed. So, you know, you set up a discussion board or a Facebook group, you encourage people to go there and have exciting interactive conversations. And the one motivated student is there every day saying, does anyone else want to talk about exercise five? And everyone else is saying, do I have to do this? Is it assessed? Is it? No, it's not assessed. We, we created this digital space for you to interact with your colleagues around the world in a, in a fun and interactive, motivating way. So it's not assessed. No, it's not assessed. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go and watch Netflix. So this idea that just because we've set something up on technology, students are automatically going to be motivated, I think is it's a complete myth. Motivated students would be motivated if you told them to do their homework on the back of a piece of toilet paper, okay? Um, you tell them to do it online, they'll do it. You tell them to do it in their workbook, they'll do it. Students who aren't that motivated, which is most students, won't be any more motivated because your homework's presented like this. They've still got to sit down, do it, read it, find time away from Facebook or TikTok or whatever, or Netflix, and put the work in to do this. So it's not a magic bullet. It's not a kind of fix all problems, instant solution. A lot of the time, too, as I said, you have new technology, but basically quite old fashioned techniques. So, you know, the old fashioned flashcards that many of us used to have on bits of, well, many of us still have, in fact, on bits of paper that you test yourself on. Well, now you can do exactly the same digitally. Um, I, I had a look at what's available out there for learning Spanish from English, and you get weird, random things like this. So I can see the English words for compete and delay and rampage and out. And I can see if I can remember their single Spanish word translations, say them, click them, turn them over. Obviously, you can also adapt these slightly more competently if you're using something like, you know, Quizlet or something, which allow a bit more interactivity. But still, a lot of the time, we're basically just replacing old techniques that we used to use in the kind of physical pen and paper classroom with new digital ways of repeating the same activities and repeating the same techniques. And again, they're no more motivating than the old techniques were. I have Quizlet on my phone because I'm trying to learn Russian and I'm still trying to keep my Indonesian up to scratch. And, you know, every now and then when I'm on a plane or a train or something, I do force myself to do a little bit of Quizlet work. And then I check Facebook and I vanish down the rabbit hole, and then I think, oh shit, I'm supposed to be learning my Russian again. And I go back and do 10 more minutes, but it's hard and boring, and there's, there's very little immediate reward, whereas I could be just chatting with my friends online elsewhere. So again, just because it's in digital format, it doesn't make it any more motivating than the old techniques. On top of all of that, I think it gets worse, because we've kind of come to a stage now where we've outsourced a lot of our memories okay and this is going to continue because as tech gets better and as we can all go to china and hold our phone over a chinese language menu and have it instantly translated for us we're all going to get slightly lazier and slightly less 
interested in doing the hard yards, doing the donkey work, that's really going to help us learn languages to a fluent degree. And a lot of the time, I think, making things easier isn't necessarily useful or beneficial for students. And there's been all kinds of research into this. Um, there was a guy called Sparrow who did a lot of research on the effect that Google has on memory. And, you know, unsurprisingly, increasingly, we're ending up being able to recall where we can find things rather than recalling the things themselves. Um, there's a great bit of research by De Stefano and Lefebvre where they looked at reading online compared to reading on paper. OK, and again, unsurprisingly, hypertext, particularly those kind of like, you know, Wikipedia pages, newspaper articles, etc., they impair reading because they're doing two things. They're distracting us with all of the surrounding stuff. OK. A bit like if you're watching football and you've got all those adverts flashing past in the background, it kind of stops you watching what you're doing. When we're reading hypertext, we're bombarded by images, by adverts, by stuff around the hypertext, but we're also seduced by hyperlinks, okay? And sometimes when we're reading, we end up clicking and then clicking again and then clicking again, and you forget what the original article was. And what they found was when you're reading in hypertext, you remember both less content and less language that the content came wrapped up in than you do if you're just reading on a plain white sheet of paper, okay? That may change over time, who knows? We may adapt in some ways over time. But if you're interested as a language teacher, in helping your students to remember content and to remember language, well, hypertext isn't the best way for that to occur. It may be easier to disseminate in a digital classroom. It may be easy to get everyone to access a page online. Easier doesn't necessarily mean better. There's this idea that we encourage interactivity through tech, okay? The um, infamously named interactive whiteboards or, you know, the glorified blow-up course book, as I think they were often used as, you know, instead of kind of going, look, exercise three, you could now have a great big fuck-off exercise three behind you on the interactive whiteboard screen, and you could go, behold, look at my vast exercise three. And I think a lot of the time we're, we're over-relying on tech. If we think tech is going to transform our classrooms into something more interactive and fun, simply through its existence, we're missing what creates interactivity. Interactivity in the digital classroom, as in the face-to-face -face classroom, comes through students and through teaching and through teachers. And for me, you know, what it means is, it's just thinking about what you're doing as you're teaching language, because you're a language teacher, with the language that you're teaching. And when you've got something like, you know, this is just an exercise I ripped out of one of my own course books, Outcomes. As I'm going through this kind of thing, as I'm checking answers or I'm working with this kind of language, whether it's from a course book or whether this is language that's emerged organically in your classroom, you know, that you've taught in a kind of dogma style in response to things students have said. You want to be interactive, learn to work with the language. So if you've got something like crimes almost non-existent, you can leave your front door unlocked. You can ask anything else that might be almost non-existent apart from crime. Yeah, my social life this year join the club. There's a recession. The economy is in a total mess. What usually happens when there's a recession? <laughs> We're living through one. You know, everyone gets made redundant and unemployment goes through the roof and um, social unrest starts to increase and the fabric of society starts to tear. What's the opposite? The economy is booming. What happens when the economy is booming? You can undermine national unity. Can you think of any policies that might undermine national unity? Yes, imposing lockdowns on the north of England, but not the south. Well done, Westminster. Anything else you can undermine apart from national unity? So you can have a water shortage. Anything else there might be a shortage of, okay? 
yeah, a shortage of um, decent self-study online material that's not based on a words plus grammar approach to language. <laughs> Policies can boost your standing in the world. Not if you live in England, but maybe if you live in other countries. Um, anything else you can boost apart from people's standing in the world? Anything else that might boost a country's standing in the world apart from their policies? When you're asking those kind of questions, all kinds of things come back at you from the students. Even asking very basic questions. I was doing a pre-int class this week online and uh, we had this sentence about, are you growing a beard? Because one of the students could see the other student and was going, ah, Roman. Ah, oh, ah, oh, you, beard. So yeah, yeah, so are you growing a beard, Roman? And we had a little thing about other verbs you can use with beards, okay? Very entertaining. So you can grow a beard, you can shave your beard off. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, if you've got one of those hipster beards, you can wax your beard. One of my elderly Russian students then said, pull food from. So, oh, oh, oh. What, what kind of food? egg and apparently her husband has a, a big bushy beard and most mornings she has to pick little bits of egg out of his beard before he goes off to work well that was interactive and very entertaining um it happened through technology but it didn't happen because of technology it happened because i asked a simple question about a piece of language that students interacted with and where I then interacted with their interactions. And that's what makes things interactive in a classroom. These kind of interactive questions that you ask, they're usually open, okay? Can you think of any other reasons why? What happens when you, what might be the problem if? They're usually connected to outcomes or the reasons why you might use these words. Sometimes they focus on different aspects of knowing a word. So if you know the word recession, do you know the opposite? If you know the word recession, do you know that the country has been sli is sliding into recession? Do you know the extra language that you might use around that time? And then when you're personalizing the language and authenticating it in your digital classroom, you're kind of practicing it in a personal way. You know, can you think of any examples of policies that have what was it, uh, you know, undermined national unity in your country? Uh, in what way has, has, has the, the standing of your country been boosted in recent years? So there's kind of space for personalised, meaningful practice. Which brings us to really just what are we doing with all of this stuff? So when we're teaching online or when we're teaching face to face, why, what's the point? What principles are driving the practice that we're engaged in? Well, I think an interesting place to start is the CEFR, the Common European Framework. Um, like many of you, I'm guessing, it's become a kind of ever-increasing presence in my life over recent years as its influence kind of impacts more and more. Interestingly, the CEFR says it doesn't specify teaching digitally or non-digitally, okay? It just talks about teaching as teaching whatever the medium of delivery that we're engaged in. And it basically says when we're teaching a foreign language, face to face or online, we should be helping our students with the business of everyday life. Uh, we should be helping them to exchange ideas, thoughts, feelings, opinions and experiences. We should be helping them understand other cultures, other ways of thinking and other ways of life better. And as teachers, we should be defining worthwhile and realistic objectives for the course as a whole, as explicitly as we can. We should be basing our teaching and learning on the needs and the characteristics and the resources of our learners. And, you know, maybe out of this, we might need to develop appropriate methods for classroom delivery and maybe develop appropriate materials that help students to learn about the business of everyday life, exchange ideas and feelings, understand other cultures, etc. So that's one way to think about what you're doing in class. You know, when you're teaching online or face to face, 
is your lesson today helping students do one of these top three things? If not, what's the point of it and why are you doing it? There may be other reasons, okay? But I think it's good to think about that these seem to me to be why you learn language. You know, you don't learn language just so that you can spend 10 minutes being able to explain the present perfect to other poor sods who are learning your language. You learn a language to do these things. And so as teachers, we need to be asking ourselves to what degree is what we're doing, doing these things. I think there are also just basic principles that underpin how learning works. In order to learn bits of language, whether that's a word, a chunk, a collocation, a phrase, a grammar structure, whatever it is, there's basically three, four, five steps that we all go through. You need to encounter this bit of language and understand it, have it explained to you or translated to you or, you know, a picture of it shown to you or something. We need to notice something or, or be helped to notice something by teachers um, about the form and about the way in which the item is used. We probably need to hear it at some point. We need to do something with it, okay? And I suspect pretty much anything, to be honest, but we need to do something with it. Personally, I think it's best if we do something personally engaging and meaningful with it and then we repeat it's like rinse and repeat rinse and repeat and through doing this repeatedly over time things start to stick okay so again in our teaching we need to be asking ourselves are we ensuring that these things are happening if you're doing a one-off lesson about, you know, royal wedding passes without a hitch as Kate and William seal it with a kiss. OK, well, maybe they understand meaning. Maybe they notice it. Are they doing anything with it? Is it personally meaningful? And how are you allowing repeated encounters with this stuff over time? If you're not, well, is there maybe another way that you could bring something into the classroom that will allow you to do this? There are also language principles. And for me, as I said earlier, a lot of the problems I have with a lot of what's still out there online is that they don't tally, it doesn't tally with my own beliefs about language and learning. I think that seeing real usage is important. Seeing how language actually works is important. I think way too many students still struggle because they're studying English in some weird, invented EFL ease kind of bubble which presents them with odd examples of the language. I think grammar and vocab are interdependent. It's not helpful to think of them as separate entities. I think ultimately vocab's more important than grammar um, simply because there's a hell of a lot more of it, okay? Um, it, it's the sort of bottom line. I think better skills whether that means reading skills, listening skills, digital skills, critical thinking skills, mediation skills, 21st century skills, all of those skills, they come from better language knowledge. If you want to be better at any of those things, you need to learn more language. I think the wants, needs and abilities of our students should determine the level should determine the language we pitch at them and the language we expect back, not a kind of fixed tick box approach to grammar. And I think frequency and relevance to communicative outcomes should be what determines the vocab that we expose our students to and the language that forms whatever kind of syllabus we're trying to work with with our students. It certainly shouldn't just be little closed lexical sets. For me as a teacher, I find it weird to say as an online language school owner, because it's a bit, bit new for all of that. But as someone who runs a kind of online you know, set of language classes, I guess, my own principles about what we're doing and what we offer and why I think you know, we're slightly different maybe, is all of our online classes promise to be language rich. We hope that the language is language that's useful 
to the students in their lives and as part of the communicative outcomes they're trying to achieve. We use students as a resource and we leave space for this in the classroom. We ensure that students always have the opportunity to exchange ideas, thoughts, feelings, opinions uh, and experiences. We try to build in a recognition of and an acceptance of diversity in its broadest kind of sense. And we do try to build in links to continued learning, which may involve further interaction with technology outside of the digital classroom. So finally, just to sort of wrap up before I see if there are any questions, some principles for using tech or maybe for not using tech, okay? You know, hopefully at some point in the future, we all get to choose whether or not we, we want to carry on just working via Zoom uh, or whether or not we want to go back into a physical class. Um, we were talking just before we got started about the second wave and new lockdowns and everything. And at the moment, it, it seems like a bit of a distant dream, but I guess these things pass at some point in some way. And we have a choice about how we want to deliver our teaching. Well, I think whatever kind of teaching we're doing, whether it's face to face, uh, you know, I know this is also face to face, but I'm using it as shorthand for in a physical real classroom, or whether it's online, teaching needs to be driven by a focus on language and a focus on desired outcomes. Teaching needs to leave space for our students. It may be that sometimes a non-tech way of doing things may be better, okay? We need to ask ourselves, well, what are the advantages of doing it this way? What do I lose? What are the advantages of doing it that way? What do I lose? It may also be that a tech way of doing things is better. And I think finally, and this is something that's really been driven home to me this year, is don't let workaholics be our model, okay? Um, don't feel guilty because you haven't checked out that email that came round about 37 new tech tools that you should be integrating into your classroom. If you've learned to use Zoom this year and you're delivering teaching through Zoom and it's working all right for you, and you get that email that says nine new alternatives to using Zoom, do yourself a favor, press delete. Don't even bother reading it, okay? Um, you've learned to use a platform, it's working for you. Sure, there'll be someone else using another platform, okay? Different, not necessarily better. And I just think it's, it's looking at how much, in a way I think my approach to teaching online is very similar to what I ended up doing as a classroom teacher which is stripping away all of the extraneous crap that gets between me, the language, and the students. As a younger teacher, I used to bring in piles and piles of extra photocopies and games and warmers and activities, and I used to stress that I wasn't teaching properly unless students left class with a, a wall of paper that had kind of devastated the forests of the Amazon. In the same way, I think, a lot of teachers feel I'm not teaching online properly if I'm just using Zoom and breakout rooms and sending some language to students. I need to be integrating more video and more tools and animation. And really, do you? Are the students happy? Are they learning? Are you focusing on language and outcomes? Are you leaving space for them? If you are, you're probably doing a good enough job, okay? There will always be someone who will hype themselves more than you. Hype is just hype. The reality of language teaching is we're there to teach language and there's more to life ultimately than teaching. And you know, if every year was a reminder of this fact that there's more to life than work, there's more to life than teaching, um, there's more to life than spending our every waking moment stressing about the degree to which we're keeping up with all of the latest trends, this is that year. So hopefully that's provided some ideas and thoughts for your own online practice and face-to-face -face practice. I'll just finish by saying if anyone's interested, please do have a look at what we do on lexicallab.com. 
We also have online tutor development courses as well as language courses pitched mainly at sort of advanced and proficiency students. We're on Facebook, you can go there and like us. And if anyone wants to get in touch or has extra questions that we don't get round to now, it's just hugh at lexicallab.com. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and throw it over to everyone and see if there are any questions or anything. Are you still helping my students mediate enough? Am I on top of all of the... How much more guilt does anyone need to take on board? You know, and I think at some point you just have to kick back and say, I know what I'm doing and I know I'm pretty good at it. Thank you. And you I know, think this you is carry especially on selling true. What selling, but, but I'm fine, thank you. And, and, and don't feel bad about that because there'll always be someone else. I, I think we've also come to this weird stage where we've started judging teachers not by their teaching or what they do in a classroom, but by how tech savvy they are and how self promotional they are. You know, and because of Instagram and YouTube and all of this kind of thing, a lot of people are very clever at creating platforms for themselves that their material and their advice and their content doesn't necessarily tally with, shall we say, you know, and there's lots of really, really great teachers out there who don't have this kind of huge social media profile or platform but are doing really, really good jobs and don't need to be made to feel guilty because they're not, you know, on TikTok with 10,000 followers or something. It's, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. I think there needs to be more focusing on another thing Michael Swan said that always stuck with me, which is, um, you know, ki kids aren't designed to need perfect parents and students aren't designed to need perfect teachers. Good enough is good enough. And sometimes it's just kind of, it's, it's hard for all of us because that's why we're here on a Saturday. You know, it's, but just accepting, I'm good enough, thank you. You know, and then giving yourself a break. And I think this is probably especially true for women as well. Do you think so? so? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, having to deal with more than one thing at the same time. I mean, being a great mom, being a great teacher, being a great organizer, being no, on top of things. Further, further layers of guilt, yeah? Yeah, I mean, guilt is, is yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I feel like we should be doing this session on a Sunday morning. Right. <laughs> and, and, and then going off to church yeah, online. Exactly, you know, glass of wine and a bit of a confessional. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks a million. Um, it Thank was definitely you. really, really interesting. Enjoy the rest of your day and I look forward to when we're able to meet face to face again. Yeah. Totally. Okay, right. big hug care, from Barcelona. All right. Take care, take care from North London. <laughs> <laughs>